You can leave the uh, smoothie. That'd be, yeah, I'd like the smoothie. <laughs> Good morning, Terra Nova. We are coming right to the end of our first Corinthians. I'm just going to do something I rarely do. I'm going to raise a stand for my height. doesn't happen a whole lot. The way that we as Christians uh, hear the word through preaching is kind of unusual, right? It's nothing like those who received the letter. They heard it in one reading. Have you ever looked at your DVDs and you can go to that menu and see it's in chapters? It, this would be the equivalent, the way we hear preaching, of taking a DVD and watching a chapter a week and then spending that time talking about, you know, they made that shot, they must have had a drone in there and the special effects, and then you watch another one over the course of maybe four months, you've now completed the movie. It's going to be a little bit hard to get everything that was there. So what I'm going to try to do today is set up some time for review. The, the goals that I have for us in closing out the series of this will look where we've been and distill some lessons from it and then finally complete chapter 16, which 15 is the resurrection, right? Paul really hits the final notes of everything he's been talking about and then it's, by the way, we're going to have an offering and this guy's visiting. It's almost like the announcements. This is like Dennis Gardner taking over for the Apostle Paul at this last part and just telling them what's going on. So here's the roadmap for today. First, we'll review. Uh, we'll talk about Paul, Corinth, and us and see once again those similarities that you can put the church in different times and different places. They can be people of different nations and different generations, and yet there's still something so common for us in that. And secondly, we'll talk about the wrap-up which Paul will close with money, people, and faithful love, if I had to break up those three. Uh, first, we'll jump into prayer and then head back to the Word. So join me in prayer, if you would. Oh, gracious Father in heaven, thank you for these times that we can be here together, that we can worship. Thank you even for the words of uh, Pastor Rob just encouraging us in so many ways already today, Lord, that you live. And we, we want by faith to just grab hold of that today. So, Father, we ask that through your word, your living spirit who, who authored this word, your spirit who indwells your sons and daughters would be very active in this place and that we would be responsive to your spirit, that we would hear from you and that it would bring encouragement and we would embrace those things you, encouragement, you encourage us in and that it would bring conviction to our hearts, Lord, and that we would turn from sins from which you convict us. And then on both sides, Lord, the encouragement and conviction, we would find our Lord Jesus behind all of those and as a church that we would move closer to him in whose name we pray now. Amen. So we move back to close out with Corinth, and let's just take a minute to remember who these people are. It begins with Paul, who was the founding pastor at Corinth and now has moved on throughout the Grecian world. He's in Ephesus at this time. Paul, whose, whose life was really marked by pathways that he didn't understand what they were for until after the fact, right? He, he's born with a privilege of his time. He's a Roman citizen. He's from the wealthy, powerful place in this world, a place where many wished they had their citizenship. You feeling this a little bit? You, you guys are like Paul in that. You're, you're from a country that is like the prosperous place, the place where so many people want to be. And Paul sees this pathway, and, and he, he uses this. In, in Acts chapter 16, uh, I'll just read this. It won't be on the screen. It says this in verse 37 and following. But Paul said to them, this is Paul before the authorities in Jerusalem. They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves to take us. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. He'll use it again when in trouble with Rome in Acts 22, verses 25 and following. When they had stretched him out for the whips, and this was serious persecution, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Just pause. I'm amazed by the calmness of St. Paul, right? Hey, I just have a question. As you're stretching me out and about to whip me, large military guy, is, is it within the code of law to do this? I mean, just the fact that he has that going, no, 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 no. That's more what I would have been, I think. And when, when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man's a Roman citizen. So the tribune came out and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizen for a citizenship for a large sum. But Paul said, I am a citizen from my birth. So he used this privilege multiple times. Everything that he had became something he stewarded over for his life, a short life, in ministry to the Lord. 
he had access to great teachers within his religious background. It said multiple times that he was a student of Gamaliel, a guy who was held in high esteem. When he died, the, 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 the writer said that the, the light of the Torah, the brightness of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, seemed to shine a little less brilliant because of that guy and his ability to teach and impact people. It, it, in Acts 5, when Gamaliel is the one who steps forward to the, to the council who's getting ready to beat Peter and John and says, look, we don't want to be fighting these people because if God's behind them, we're fighting God. If God's not behind them, they're just another set of idiots and this religious movement will die out. And he gives this calming wisdom that changed the situation. He's described in that passage as one who was honored by all the people. That's Paul's teacher, that kind of wisdom, that kind of ability. He was a guy who had these privileges. When, when he's arrested in the temple, he reflects this in the beginning of Acts 22 to the Jewish people when he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are to this day. I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. He saw everything in his life as an opportunity that God could use for the advancement of the gospel and of ministry. What a great marker for us to take inventory. Sometimes I think we forget what we're stewarding over. We're forgetting and looking only at what we want next in our ambitions. When the things God has already given us are really useful for what he will do in our lives, even the painful things in our lives, we're called to steward over those difficulties. God has entrusted you with a lot in the map of your life. Paul is not without limitations and shortcomings. Uh, he was a guy who seems to have had bad eyesight. Uh, it comes out in the scriptures in different ways. In his letter to the church in Galatia, when he's talking about this illness that he's suffering with, he says to them, What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. So it's something going on there. Also in that letter when he closes, he says, You know I write this last part with my own hand, they usually had a scribe write things because of such large letters that are being used. He, he probably couldn't see very well, which also makes some sense if we go back into Acts when they're stoning Stephen, that they ask Paul to watch the other guy's coats rather than have the near blind guy throwing rocks in any direction. Going, Did I hit him? Like this, you stay there, Paul. You're very bright. You have your place. When we, when we look at Paul's life after the fact, it makes sense studied theology of the scriptures deeply, was a passionate, ambitious man, always looking for the next opportunity. And then when he comes to Christ, he becomes a guy who's the great theologian who writes the book of Romans. He becomes the guy who's the missionary statesman who brings the gospel to change the world. People who are hunters, and a guy was trying to teach me something about deer hunting, because I've only hunted the, the little rabbity things, um, was, was saying when you, when you hit it, it runs, and you have to kind of follow the blood trail that's there. I know I'm horrifying a certain percentage of people, but I, I don't really care, I guess. Um, the, the hunters are supposed to look for the blood and try to figure out, okay, if I projected this, he went here, 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 he's going to be that way, and then follow after it. Sort of like looking at your life as a map. You only have half the map. You only have what you've lived so far, but there's more life ahead. If you were to try to follow the blood trail in your map, and let's, let's Christianize it and say the blood trail of what Jesus has done in your life, where would you expect it to go next? What's the stuff where you need to say, yeah, as I look at it, there's no way this piece of my life should continue into the second half. This is stuff I need to repent of and leave. It's been there way too long. It doesn't make sense of the map of a woman or man who's following Jesus. It could be the stuff where you say, I, I went through all of this. It didn't particularly seem to have holy origins to it, but God might use this. How can I pray about using this piece of my life? It may be skills that you have that you never imagined would be used by the church, but the church is a very diverse body that needs all sorts of activity because we're a living organism. What's your pathway? Be encouraged by Paul, but seek out your own stuff. Don't be surprised, though, if God redirects you as you're asking him to use your life. As you become submissive to him and say, Lord, I mean it. I just want to lay it down and be yours. I want to be moved like a chess piece on a board. I just want to stop all my resistance. He did that with Paul. It was in a moment where the guy with the poor eyesight with great ambition was now blinded by a vision of the risen Jesus. 
And, and now he needed to rely on other people, not his own ambitions. And in that moment of stripping Paul down to bare essence, Paul found his salvation. The intersection of God in your life is the single greatest pivot point a man, woman, or child can have in their lifetime. And it'll happen multiple times. In a society where humans are now very careful to talk about our own intersectionality as people, I mean, what a mistake if we don't deeply discuss and contemplate the intersection of God and humanity. If we only have us in the conversation, I don't have much interest in that conversation. For Paul, it was seeing who Jesus was, the risen Lord, not a theology to be fought against anymore, but a person, God, become man and ascended again. Blinded and in that state, he, he couldn't act without help anymore. He literally, the ambitious, strong, educated Roman citizen, needed someone to guide him around for a time. There's a humility that comes with being a Christian. We, we have to grow to a point of stability. And then he's healed, but only through being reliant on the church. God could have spoken and healed him. But he says, you need to go to this one, this other Christian, and his prayers will be the one. That This is not a venture of how can I make my own individual identity in Christ stronger and better. This is actually a more unique exercise than that. It's how do we cultivate a we identity. Most of the time, and I'm like you, I think about the Christian story as me and Jesus. Here's what's happening in my life. Here's what I need in my life. Here's what I used to have in my life. Here's what I'd like in my life. Here's the prayers for me. To cultivate a we identity... We have to start valuing the people of God and our part in that above our individual self. That's a hard one. That's a lifetime commitment that says, I am buying into God's plan as the Lord of the church, as this body that he's building, and I want my identity to be the church identity. There's no fullness without that. We need to practice that we identity. Paul moves from this zealous persecutor of the church to the one who's the apostle of the church at that time. And he sees the body grow, and he's always ambitious for the next place, to go where the gospel hasn't been taught before, he'll put it. And now he's in Ephesus, writing back to Corinth, a, a church that he had seen planted, saw the very seed of it, kind of shaped in its teaching, and now word has come to him that there are problems, and he answers those. That, that's where we've been with the church at this point. If we talked about the church in Corinth, they're in Corinth, and that's significant. If you remember, we talked about how the slang of the day to Corinthian eyes was a slang for being immoral. That was the reputation of the city. When you talked about it, that's what you knew, right? You might say, New York, oh, that's a place of financial industry. L.A., that's a place of entertainment industry. Boston, that's a place where they talk funny. And all these places have their own identity. Corinth was sexual immorality. And the church is never divorced from its culture. We incarnate, we become flesh, the body of Christ in a place and in time, just like Jesus did. Because that's the definition of incarnation. When God, the eternal God, above and beyond all creation and culture, took on flesh and stood in that culture, eternity, meeting time. The problem is with church, we as human beings can start to let time become the dominant thing. And the culture can start to wash over even the eternal presence of God in us if we just let it. And it was a city that was steeped in philosophy, not far from Athens. So they had traveling philosophers. They were sort of the preachers and writers of the day that people would listen to. Steeped in sexual morality from the temples that were there. And you can tell it's a man-made religion, right? When they say, hey, you need to sacrifice for your religion. And your sacrifice involves having sex with people. This is, this is not a holy religion. This is something someone very selfish just invented and tried to do. A city that was steeped in that, but also in great economic uh, disparity. In other words, it was part of the human condition to just be a Corinthian living in Corinth. And the church's problems, you can see what's going on. All the competing philosophers, people would look and say, I want to believe in this philosopher, and I fight against this philosophy. They took it into the church and started saying, I like this preacher, and not that one. This one's better because I follow after this one. And they began to faction and split because the world does that all the time. The world is in constant competition, but the church is just wounded when it behaves like it's in competition. It's not whole. It's meant to be one body. And, and the fix for this is, when Paul starts telling them God has to be preeminent. He has to be first, not a teacher, not a church, not a denomination, not a way of doing things, a style of music. God has to be first. 
It's the only way to free us from a human obsession with other people. When God is number one, we realize that all the other people are number two. I giggled over this late into the night last night when I thought of that sentence. Uh, but it, it helps us have perspective that God is number one and everyone else is below that. Sexual immorality became a problem that Paul talked about in chapter 5 and 6. The culture just raged and it changed the way the people lived eventually. Stuff that they would have said no to maybe once, stuff that in the gospel when they first heard it they had rejected, was so present that it was, well, normalized. They, they laughed at it in the plays, they heard other people's stories and said nothing, and after a while it just became their actions as well. And Paul literally has to say to them, you have a guy who's sleeping with a stepmother, and no one's confronting him, and people are actually being arrogant about this, like somehow you're cool because you're sinning like this. Any of the sins that we embrace that are just around us in the culture should never be celebrated by the church. We don't want to legalistically just shoot our own, but man, we are uncaring, calloused, sin-filled brothers and sisters. If we don't go to people in sin and say, hey, we need to talk about this. I got stuff in my life, but you and I need to talk because you're just living a life that has, looks like it forgot Jesus. And we need to be praying about this and not just saying, this, this is fun. Let's do this for a season like everyone else gets to do. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexual immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of this world. See, that's the tension he's talking about. The church is meant to be with each other and not meant to look like the world in terms of that moral life anymore. We're supposed to say to people in the church, man, you need to live better. You're chasing after Jesus. You need to be doing this. And when they don't, Paul said, you actually need to put them out of the church. Steal away the hope that they have. Let them suffer for a while. He'll even say in the scriptures, turn such a one over to Satan, harsh language, that with the destruction of their flesh, when they're living this out and it's dissatisfying and it's bringing death to them, their soul may be saved. That, that's what he wants for us. He talks about the lawsuits against the brethren in chapter 6. They can't solve their own dispute, so they start living like anyone else in this world. Someone has to be bested and someone has to pay. Paul will say this to them in chapter 6. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. He, he, he appeals on, on two different places. That your family, so you shouldn't be doing this to family. You shouldn't treat each other this way if you're living as brothers and sisters. There has to be resolution besides going to court and having the magistrates force someone to do something. And kingdom. He'll continue in verse 9 and say, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He says your status has changed. Stop living like it hasn't. Stop living like you're just someone who believes in Christ and the rest of the world is just the way that you live all the time. Because you're family and because you're part of the kingdom, you live differently with each other. In chapter 7, he told us about marriage, celibacy, and divorce. And he talks a lot about the sexual issues they were having and singleness. And what do people do if we're struggling with all this? And he basically says, you're good where God has you. If you're single, he's in your life. Don't, don't worry so much about the status change. Love the Lord where you are. And if you're married... Live well where God has you. It's going to be difficult. Paul actually says it's more difficult because now you have two sinners in close proximity over a long period of time. This is not the formula for harmonious joy, right? This is, this is marriage like two rocks in a tumbler working off the rough edges. He talks about eating meat to idols, which can seem odd, but really is saying how do we live in a world that isn't controlled by us? where the economics of the world were evil at that time, that all the meat had been sacrificed to idols, where we look at companies who if, if you saw what they did, you wouldn't want to buy their stuff. Do you know how many companies are just using essentially child slavery and selling products in the United States? And we put them on every day because it's tough to find products that aren't like that. And Paul says, look, some of you are looking at what's going on in this evil world and saying you can eat this, you can't eat this. And his whole argument is actually care about one another more than the stuff. 
Don't cause another Christian to stumble. Live well with each other. Don't believe in the foolish power of idols, and don't jump in and live in that culture as though it's nothing. It talks about women praying and prophesying with their heads uncovered, with everything to do with the culture at the day, and especially the way the prostitutes had dressed at that time. Here's the challenge, men and women. You should look different than the cultural sinful archetypes of your gender. If the power of your gender is seen as sexuality these days, and it's just literally stripping down to the bare minimums, you should look different, Christian women. You shouldn't just try to fit into the mold that's sold to you by every actress, every television ad, and every clothing catalog. You should be godly more than you should worry about that. Guys, if it's swinging the pendulum and it's brutally strong guys who are insensitive or it's some sort of feminized male who is just sensitive and has no really seeming traditional masculine qualities to him, you shouldn't be going after that. You, you should be someone who, who's living the way that God says men and women should live. You should be a strong, helpful, loving man. Women and men living that out in Corinth would have put a complete confusion and zap on that culture. People would have said, why do you live so differently? It talks about the Lord's Supper, that intimate emblem of togetherness, of the Lord sacrificing for us. And they were actually ruining that. They were giving preferences, and, and the rich were eating and having their Lord's Supper first before other people could even get off work. We do this together, a sign of spiritual unity that we can actually ruin and divide as well. And spiritual gifts, the, the very presence of God living in us, these were people who had factionalized. They stopped believing in unity, so that's going to create the same problems over and over. It wasn't just with leaders. They were now competing of who got the better gifts and, and who should be like celebrated for these gifts. He addresses each of these and then comes to this massive crescendo. After 14 chapters of sinfulness in their life, he comes to 15. And he spends this really long chapter talking about the resurrection that we just hit Easter week last week. It's a place where all the things are answered in Christ. Every piece had its own answer, but ultimately they all rest on this pedestal of what God did for us in Christ, that he came to be with us, to die for us, and rose to rule over us. So where's the place in your life where you live more like chapters 1 through 14? Where you could miss that the foundation of your life is Christ and what he's done for you because you're more worried about economics or theological arguments or, or sexual immorality in your life or the lives of others. Where's the place where the redemptive work has become second? And how can you make the main thing the main thing again? And that brings us to chapter 16. It's a market shift. Chapter 15 is like the everything passage. All 14 chapters before that answered in chapter 15, the greatness and glory of Jesus Christ. And then comes this other stuff. Paul essentially doing management business of how the church has to work. And he begins with money. He'll write this in chapter 16, verse 16 following, uh, verse 1 and following. Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of each week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Money in the church. It is an enormous topic because there's been a lot of abuse because guess what? Human beings abuse money, whether they're in the church or not. It's one of the ways that we can sin that gets common. I don't talk a lot about money. Haven't in the, in the pulpit. Some would say and have told me, you do that to the detriment of the church. You don't talk about this enough. But let me tell you why I don't talk about it. I, I was a non-Christian in the heyday of televangelists in the 80s. And one of the big gripes I had against the church were people who just seemed to be stealing money who are taking these holy and sacred things and reducing it to an 800 number where you could call in and give money. Literally saw the film in the 80s of a guy with a pile of fake money in a bag who was saying, if you give, God will bless you sevenfold. And he starts shoveling money into this bag, telling people they should give because he was putting God on the line to do a mathematical equation. Not, not a deep formula for the greater blessings God will give you, but you will get literally $7 for every $1 that you give. 
And I watched all this nonsense with horror and thought, nah, these people are nuts. And, and so I didn't talk much about it. Here at Terra, we've strongly emphasized three pieces of giving that I believe are completely biblical. They go like this. We give generously, regularly, and sacrificially. First, generously. It means that we're disciples of God to give generously. That we've looked at who this God is and we've seen generosity just pours from this being. It's constant. A world that could have been created just for stark existence, he poured out his creative beauty and order upon it just so we could see how generous and wonderful our God is. When we were lost in sin and had rebelled against him, it would have been so easy to just kill the whole world and start again, to shake the extra sketch and draw something different. But instead, he generously sent his son to die in our place so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be reunited with God. If you don't understand giving generously of your life, of your materials, of your time, I don't think you really understand who it is that you claim to be following. You can't miss the generousness of our God. We're also told that we should give regularly. That, that's this passage. Set aside what you prosper each week. It's easy to forget and think, oh, yeah, I, I give sort of regularly and then add up what you've given and realize, man, I was actually sort of stingy with what I gave. If someone asked what I gave, I would have said it was X percent. And we don't put a number on it, but I'll tell you, we, my wife and I try to give 10%. That's what we shoot for is just to move the decimal point over. I'm not gifted at math, right? So 10% works really well. If it was like 7.62%, I'd probably be another religion. I wouldn't be. No, I'm just kidding. I, just, I would just do this one poorly if that was the case. A lot of you give online. Almost three quarters of the church now, I think, gives online. And that's great. Here's the one danger that we have there, if I'm telling us to get after giving regularly, generously. It's that we can sort of freeze where we financially were at one point and just keep giving based on that after a promotion or two or a successful job change. And we never really shift. It becomes sort of automatic the way it's set up rather than an act of worship. I'd encourage you to, to look at that and investigate that. And then sacrificially. Sacrificially can mean something very different to different people. It just means it cost us. And, and that can look very different from a CEO to a student. It, it might be $10,000 that, that uh, a CEO gives, and it might be $10 that a student gives, and both said, okay, that means I'm not doing something that I was going to do. One says that means I'm not going to pizza. One says, well, I'm not going to have that dinner in Fiji next week, right? It's just those things that it cost us something. If I had to put a verse on that, I would go to King David in 1 Samuel 24, 24. As he's getting ready to make a sacrifice before the temple is being built, and this guy offers to give him the stuff for free. It says this, The king said to Arana, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. It should cost you something to give sacrificially. To, to be able to say, I gave, shouldn't be something that takes no notice out of the way that you live. So we give generously, we give regularly, and we give sacrificially in Tara. We're at a place where we all need to check on that and see how we can do this better together. Uh, we're at a point where there's some changes going on. We're, we're thrilled to be able to have said to Pastor Tori, we want to hire you here. And for Tori to say, Yes, we want to be here. We, we waited a while. He had some time to think about it, which is brutal, right? It's like having 30 days after you propose to a woman to see if they're going to say yes or not. We're like, hey, Tori, we want to offer you this. Give you some time to think about it. And every day, Robin, I'm like, what is he thinking? I don't know. He walked in kind of slowly today. Maybe he's thinking no. Like We just, we just waited and waited, and then finally we, we got the answer, the yes. But that's going to take money. That boy eats. I mean, we've we got uh, to keep feeding that guy. And he's skinny, so we can't stop feeding him. No trouble then. <laughs> Ministry always takes these three things. It takes the person of God. Otherwise, it's just a museum piece, and we're just doing something as a tribute to something that happened before. It always takes the person of God. It always takes the people of God. There isn't real ministry without the church. And lastly, it takes the provisions of God. Here's where God has stored that. You guys. The church is God's account for the entire bank of the church. We have to be examining how we give generously, regularly, and sacrificially. Please pray about it. People is the next thing he talks about after money. 
talks about visiting and what's going on in Ephesus and what the Lord's going to permit there or not permit there and how there's open doors and how they need to be nice to Timothy when he comes to visit them because he teaches the same way Paul does. I want to focus on that Ephesus piece because it's almost like a cutaway that we can have because we have the book of Acts. Like he just says, hey, great and effectual doors are opening here, but there's opposition. Here's what that looks like. Acts chapter 19, verses 18 through 20. Also, many of those who were now believers confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Oh, they changed course. They were taking things that were once valuable to them that were not valuable to God and saying, these are now worthless to us. And they didn't try to sell them to someone else who was still practicing dark things. And that would have just been bad. They would have been looking for money instead of the betterment of those people. They burned them. And it says, as a result, the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. I think there were people who said, I need to understand that. Why would they destroy stuff that I value? Who are these people? Sometimes our lives ask a question that can only be answered by the gospel. I think those are the banner moments for Christians. When we live in a way that makes no sense to the natural order of the world. And they're out there burning 50,000 pieces of silver worth of stuff, not trying to save it because it was no good. There are a lot of times where Paul is in these other places in the book of Acts, and we see that God is always doing more than what we know. I want to encourage you with that. We can get myopic at times and only see our own problems and our own struggles or our own glory and our own triumphs. The church is enormous. It's in every continent, it's in almost every people group. And the struggles and triumphs of the church are large and God's continually active. Just because right now in North America, we're, we're looking like we're a dying minority. We can know the church is actually growing vitally in other continents right now. God has not lost. He has not turned away. This isn't the end. We constantly need to be seeing these other things that are going around, even if it's just a quick look now and again. And he mentions all these other people, and he's going to do that more ahead, that there's more people. Look at verse 15 in chapter 16. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they, were, they devoted themselves to service of the saints. They were genuine Christians. Be subject to these, and to every fellow worker in labor. I rejoice that the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaius and Icacus because they had made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prissa, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. Not just greetings, hearty greetings. And the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Those first converts who served all the saints, a man and a woman who used their home as a place for the church to meet regularly, you know that was a regular burden because I know how it goes when we're having people over, whether it's marital counseling or a small group. Diane starts cleaning that house differently. I love having people over just because the house always looks better if we have people over once a week. It's just another reason to be hospitable. Your home will be cleaner if you keep being hospitable. But these people gave. And Paul says, as a result, you should subject yourselves to those who are really living it out well. You have people in this church who are over you in some ways. Not over you in authority like, like the military might have where they have a rank and you have to jump if they say jump. I mean like small group leaders or tribe leaders who are opening their homes regularly, who oftentimes will go into their wallets to get provisions for those meetings at times, who will give hours just praying and preparing and figuring out how to serve, who will visit you in the hospitals. It's, it's usually not the pastors who are doing that kind of thing. It's usually your tribe who actually knows because... We don't know unless somebody tells us, but they know because that tight-knit community. Paul says, be subject to these. Hebrews will talk about Christian leaders and how we should submit ourselves so that the ministry isn't hard for them, that it's a joy for them and good for us. This is part of that we identity when we become subject to people. I'll confess, I've had days where I wish it was like the military where we had a rank on our shoulders and you could just say, you, Christian lower rank, I need you to go do this. And they just say, yes, sir. But you know what? It would lack the great ingredient that all these people had, that Paul's going to talk about more, love. It wasn't just that Priscilla and Aquila had a big house and it could be used well. Good for them. Blessings on them for determining they would use that. It wasn't just that Stephanus devoted himself to refreshment. Good that he did. But he loved 
the church. That's all buried in Paul's final charge when he's just wrapping everything up in verse 13 and following. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all you do be done in love. And in verse 21, I, Paul, I'll write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Oh, our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ. Amen. So he says this, be alert, be watchful. It's easy to get off course, and being off course is dangerous, right? Take off in a plane heading to L.A. from New York, get off course by one degree. By the time you get there, you're in the mountains or in the ocean. One degree over a long time is a long way off. Don't let your guard down on where you're standing in Christ. Stand firm in Christ. Be watchful. Be vigilant. Get after those things, the things that he reminded us are of in first importance. My wife and I uh, are kind of food documentary nerds. Like, that's what we do if we have some time now and again. We, we sit there and watch food documentaries, and we, we've been watching this one on street food. And they had this guy who is in Delhi, India, and he makes chaat, uh, just a fried potato dish with all sorts of sauces. It's like everything, right? It's acidic and sour and sweet and just crunchy and soft. Sounds amazing. And there's stalls of these all over. They said it's like the national food of India. And this guy is recounting with tears how his father had taught him how to make this and said, don't just be about the money. Most of these places are just about the money. How cheaply you can get the ingredients, how much can they charge, and just get money. He said, be, be about the food you're giving to the people. Make it really good, caring for them, and they'll come back, and they'll, they'll give you money for it, but the money's not the most important thing. I think that's what Paul is saying when it comes to love and ministry. Yeah, use your stuff for good, that's right. Look out for other people, sure. But just like he said in 1 Corinthians 13, if you do it without love, it's meaningless. All the influence, all the stuff you give, all the gifts you have, unless you have love, he says it's worthless, empty and hollow. He'll reduce all the theology of the gospel in Romans 13 to love. Take a look at this passage. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up with this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. The law that we could not uphold. The law that Christ in his generous presence among us and his death for us lived out fully. That he gave out of love. For God so loved the world, not because God had to balance a ledger, not because God was writing a theology book and wanted to finish it well, because God loved the world, he gave his son. Love becomes like that alchemist dream who thought they could change lead to gold. We can take stuff that we would just do out of obligation, stuff that we could do because we have the resources. And when it's covered in the love of Christ, it changes it forever. Everything we do becomes something different. Last thing as the band comes up for communion, Paul cries out for the return for the real end of all of this, where he's not fighting himself, where he's not having to suffer with the church that he loves. So he says, our Lord, come. I don't live waiting for the end of my life, but I want to live that life full until the Lord comes. I want the Lord to come. I want him to come today in my life and your life. I, I want to look forward to the day when he's going to come and not be ashamed of that day. I want him to come to the people who don't know him yet in Troy in the capital district. Come, establish your kingdom. We're going to celebrate communion. And it's a place where we recognize how the Lord came that first time, that he gave his body broken for us, symbolized in those broken pieces of matzah. And that his blood was poured out as a sacrifice for our sins, symbolized by the wine and juice that's in the cup that we'll take and dip in. If he's your Lord, if you've come to him as a sinner and he came to you as a Savior and Lord, you're welcome at this table. It doesn't belong to anyone else but him, and he gives that invitation. Let's pray together as we wrap up this book. Father in heaven, Thank you for speaking to the church. Thank you that your message doesn't change, your mind doesn't change this way, and your heart doesn't change towards us. Thank you that you love a sinful people, but you love us enough not to leave us where we are. Lord, it's my prayer that you would haunt us in a holy way, that you would bring to mind again and again the people of Corinth, the church of Corinth, to help make the church of Troy a better and different church, a church that's more like Jesus and less like our sinful selves. 
We ask this in Christ's name and for his greater glory. Amen.